5. Great verse from Jesus here. Truly, truly, or verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And regardless of what state you're in right now, and I'm not talking about the U.S. state, as we do have a lot of international viewers, um, or at least a few. <laughs> Man, it's just dwindling right now. But whatever state you're in, whether you're, you're feeling really blessed or whether your eyes are clouded to that blessing, you know, God has given you so many blessings even just in our breathing. We do so many things without our, our thinking. Our blood's moving through our body. Our heart's beating. We're taking breaths. Uh, we're seeing. We have so many blessings. We, can, we have the sense of touch. We have uh, the sense of smell. Everything. It's just an amazing blessing. And we can hear. And we have ears to hear. So we have a lot to be thankful for regardless of our situation. But if you're struggling, I just pray that you would reflect on your blessings today and that hey, you'd reflect even on this blessing from Jesus where it's very clear he gave his life for us and yeah, he sacrificed his life for us, gave his life as a sacrifice for our sins and through him we can have everlasting life. And what an amazing blessing it is. And just, think, just thinking about that. <coughs> there we go. Hold on, let me get some water. <laughs> but thinking about just the, the blessing of, of uh, what Jesus did. He gave his life for us. And what's your motivation for believing in Jesus? Is it just to have everlasting life? Is it you're afraid of death and just want to live? Because I mean, that can come into it. Are you afraid of punishment? Which, that's true, we would receive eternal punishment if we reject Jesus. Scripture is very clear about that. Even Jesus says so. But, man, just to be with the Lord... And to have that motivation be the love that we have for the Lord. And just to be in his presence and, and to be in, in worship in his presence is going to be really awesome. And uh, to have that as a motivation and in believing in Jesus that we love him because he first loved us. And to be with him and to be with him in glory is going to be just a wonderful blessing. So God is all about reunion. Yeah, uh, we may see separation now. We see a, there are many people who have passed away, passed on. And we're all awaiting judgment. But when we see who has put their faith in Jesus Christ, hey, God's about reunion. So I just pray that that would be a comfort and a blessing to you today and tonight, since this is the evening here, <laughs> maybe in the morning for some of you all. All right, so talking about, uh, let's see, behavior in the midst of disaster. Um, today, today is 9-11. I wasn't really thinking of that when I was praying about the topic, but... It turns out that that's the case, and um, regardless of whether there's a terrorist attack or whatever you may call it, an, an act of evil, a, something demonically inspired that happens in this life that you know the enemy is up to steal, kill, and destroy. John 10.10 10 is very clear about that, and it's a work of the devil. And Jesus was manifest so that he would destroy the works of the devil. So when something like that happens, it really grieves the heart of God. And when lives are lost, when innocents are killed, uh, one thing that the Lord hates is the shedding of innocent blood. We see that from Proverbs. And uh, it's totally the case. You see in Proverbs 6. So let's see. I think it starts around 19-ish. There you go. Starting in 16. These six things does the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. So that's saying six, even seven. So here we go. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devise, devises wicked imaginations, feet that are swift into running into mischief, a false witness that speaks lies, and he that sows discord among brethren. And all these things, we have pride, we have dishonesty, we have false witness, so someone who breaks oaths, who doesn't keep his word, uh, who gossips, puts barriers between each other, uh, and you know it's it's uh, that and you see murder. It's it's in line with the Ten Commandments, but even so, it's just deeply in the heart of God. God desires that we love Him wholeheartedly and we love others wholeheartedly. And Jesus said that in Matthew twenty two thirty seven through thirty nine. That the first and great commandment is this: to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one is like it: love your neighbor as yourself. First John is very clear about 
hey, our motivations need to be lined up. We love God. We love others. Otherwise, what are we doing? We're inconsistent. We need to be authentic believers. And so if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, it's a walk and you give up a lot of things, including hate for others. And you can hate evil and hate the works of the enemy, but hating people is not in the books. You know, that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to love one another and, and to, to bless our enemies, to, uh, to repay evil with good. And, uh, and not to return cursing for cursing. Even Jesus on the cross. And these people were forgiven because he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And instead of lashing back and unleashing his King of Kings mode, which you know he'll come as King of Kings and Lord of Lords the second time around. Um, but uh, or I guess second full time around since he did resurrect and yeah. But um, his, his ultimate return as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He could have just lashed back when everyone was scoffing him and spitting on him, but it's, that's not <coughs> its not what he did. He forgave. So let's, let's take the model of humility and forgiveness that Jesus had. And since he has forgiven us so much, again, let's forgive others. Um, just a brief meditation, uh, but yeah, let's open in prayer and we'll actually get to the topic at hand. And uh, I want to take you to two major passages here. Uh, about behavior in dire circumstances or disaster, and really three. Uh, we'll take you to three, um, but let's open in prayer. Father, help us be authentic. I just pray, Lord, that anyone who's watching would just be blessed. If they're dealing with someone who's really messing with their head or even just doing evil things to them, I just pray that they would return the evil that they have received with good, that they would bless instead of curse, that they would uh, pray for their enemies and those who despitefully use them. God, that's the heart that you have, Lord, that even though there are many in the world who, who abuse and, um, and do evil things, Lord God, there's absolutely evil things. And Satan uses them, Lord. But I pray that as citizens of heaven, Lord God, that your children would just shine forth your light and radiate your, your love toward others. Help us love one another. Help us love you wholeheartedly. God, I know all things will fall into place when we do those things. God, when we obey you, we're going to see amazing things happen. And we, we love you. We will keep your commands. And I just pray that for all of us, Lord. Help us be faithful and obedient. Father, also for this message, just relating to disaster, I just pray that you just bring a wave of comfort and send your Holy Spirit, who is the Comforter, Thank you so much for your work in the world. Help us honor you and not to grieve you. I just pray, Father, just uh, bless this time and, and uh, make everyone's hearts and minds uh, ready to be good soil and, and receive the word and, and grow forth a major harvest. And again, just let that grow forth and do an amazing fruit for you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, again, I was in Richmond this weekend and visiting one of my friend's uh, he runs a church plant there, and it's meeting in an apartment, and kind of the vision there, too, is more of an early church type model, where it's it's a house church, and if you've kept up with GKJ, GKJ uh, was a house church, and we, we met every Sunday night for, for teaching, sometimes, you know, worship, always a meal, prayer, it's just, yeah, but we're meeting in, in homes, and that's the vision that they have in, in Richmond uh, with this, this one church and this really church planning network. And it's interesting the the reaction you get when you say, "Oh, it's a house church." And I've grown up in institutional churches my whole life, and there's so many great things that can be done through those. But just the wonders and the the intimacy and the fellowship and the worship that you can experience through a house church as well is just it's phenomenal. And not having to worry about the building fund or the cost of the building or you know property lines, everything like that. It's just okay. We're meeting as believers. Because really, the called out ones, the ecclesia, it, that's the church. <laughs> and so when you think of, oh, church is a building, it's a structure. Uh, I was actually talking to someone today, and they're like, uh, I was telling them about, oh, well, you know, it's, it's meant to be a, a church plant here, and then that evolves over to a, I guess evolves is a bad word here. Um, but it's, 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 it's going to, you know, form another community. <laughs> Evolution is not a bad word, but you know the the connotation versus the denotation is is uh, 
uh, I guess in the context too, those are three important things with any words, but oh, okay, anyway. So if that evolves into another community, into another community, into another community, and it just, it multiplies, that's, that's the model, it's multiplication. But you also have the, the intimate group where you don't have, you know, 500 people where you can hide uh, in the midst of, but you're actually actively getting most people involved, almost everyone involved. And there's a level of commitment that's healthy and, uh, and just community. That's really what you see in Acts chapter 2. But, yeah, it's interesting the reactions you get. They're like, uh, and I'm like, what? <laughs> like, that's what they did in the early church. It's like I'm not knocking the, the bigger churches, but, you know, everything is going to have its problem, okay? So you can have a large church that never evangelizes. What, what is Jesus going to say to that, that church? You think in Revelation, Jesus speaking to all those seven churches and various things to each one. But how many have lost their first love or how many are just completely lukewarm? And that's one thing you have to analyze. If you're giving your money and all they're doing is just, you know, padding up a window, how are you spending your money? You need to spend money where God's work is being moved forward and obedience is being done. And it's just, it's, it's awesome to see what the Lord does when he does things. But uh, if we're so, so sidetracked with every worldly thing that doesn't need to be there, then it's missing the mark. I know a lot of churches that use their facilities as great outreach tools and uh, again, if that's if that's how it's used, then then awesome. But you do have to measure those things. Just be wise in, you know, spending time with God to 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 see, hey, where do I need to give, or what do I need to support, and what do I need to be involved in? Am I just hiding out here and not actively using my gifts to build up the body? And in a smaller community, you can very much do that. So a lot of these larger churches will use small groups as that discipleship means. Sometimes it can work. Sometimes it just it's not a fit. So. Um, but it's, it's interesting. Uh, it was an encouraging weekend and the Lord did re uh, some really cool things. Um, so speaking about, and now getting back to finally the topic, uh, disaster. Let's go to Job chapter one. So I just encourage all who go to both large and small churches, uh, both institutional, you know, building wise or, um, or house churches, you know, just spend time with God. And again, don't forsake the gathering together of the, of the saints. That's the common denominator there. But hey, uh, I've had great experience with, uh, with pastoring GKJ and preaching and, and prayer. And um, we still do that. And we still fellowship Sunday nights, but we've moved to Tuesday night as being preparation for a more uh, kind of wide view of, of cross allegiance and uh, the web channel type imp implementation. Um, but it's, it's cool. It's really cool. Uh, and if the Lord says go back to it, hey, in a, in a heartbeat. Um, so, yeah, we always need to do that. <laughs> okay, so, um, okay, just checking when I'm streaming. Good, okay. All right, now finally, here we go. Job getting back to finally disaster. Um, speaking of Job, Job was a righteous man. And we think of figures in the Bible and we can compare ourselves to them, but we all, in comparison, just, I, I just think, man, this, this man was such a righteous, righteous follower of God. And, but okay, I, Isaiah said, you know, woe is me, I'm, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. Well, Isaiah was um, a very righteous prophet and very well known, but he sees his sin and the level of sin that's in our hearts is extremely great. It says in Jeremiah that um, the heart is desperately wicked and who can know its depths? I believe that's 17.9. Let's go there one sec. Yeah, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it or who can understand its depths? And man, but thinking of all these righteous men and he was described as perfect and upright. And here this doesn't mean like perfect as in without without sin. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about righteous or complete. And he feared God. He avoided evil. He had 10 children, which, hey, that's awesome. I love big family. Um, and he had all these possessions. It's very true that God often blesses people and blesses people that love him with great possessions. You look at Abram or Abraham after God started dealing with him. And uh, just how great Abraham was. And Isaac was also extremely, extremely prosperous. And um, just down the line. And you see some people struggled. 
Some people were extremely bountiful. And regardless of what situation it was, faith was the main thing. And faith in God's provision and faith in his son, Jesus, who would be the Messiah. And the, the Messiah was promised to come even from Genesis 3. In Genesis 3.15, it's called the Protevangelium, the first proclamation of the gospel. So, um, yeah, so... Uh, Anyway, Job was a righteous man. God blessed him tremendously, and um, and Satan, who tries men and uh, brings persecution, says, "Hey, there's, there's, um, let's see." Oh, God says, "Have you considered Job? He's he's so righteous. I, I love him." And uh, Satan's like, "Well, he would he would hate you if." Um, if you took away uh, took away the blessing on the work of his hands and took away his increase in the land, but we see the faithfulness of Job, and I think toward the end there too, you start to see him push a little bit and say, you know, why I, I don't deserve this, but God's answer at the end, very very directly, well, I'm God. <laughs> it's like, you know, that's. Uh, all the advice from the friends was just like, oh, well, obviously you've done something wrong, Job, and God chastens them and says no. <laughs> just like, you know, Elihu was, was the most righteous of the of the four, um, of the you know, three friends and Elihu, but, um, but anyway, so uh, Job had all sorts of possessions, and then all this disaster comes on him. And what is his reaction? Because he lost all of all of his children, a ton of his possessions, he had boils on his flesh, and well, actually, here in verse twenty, Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. So after the disaster, Job worshipped. Instead of saying, "God, I can't believe you did this," or shaking your fist at God and saying, "I'm just so mad. I'm so mad. Like, why did you do this to me? I'm entitled to these things." I've been righteous before. I've done all these things for you. You know, why Why are you doing this to me? Who are you? Because think of your reaction when you go through disaster. And hopefully, hopefully it's like Job's, but I think more often than not, it's it's not. And I mean, I can tell you in my case too, I went through years in which I applied for, for tons and tons of, of pastoral positions and over 400 places told me no. And so after a while, after really five years, uh, God made it clear, hey, do this, keep with cross allegiance, but but start GKJ for a season. And I was going to do it for about, you know, six months, nine months, see how it goes, and uh, end up doing that for almost four years. Uh, and, you know, that's still an option if, if God wants me to, to keep that going. But in that time, when I was searching, and even through the first, I think, few years of, of GKJ, just the, the frustrations and... Um, the depression that that happened because uh, I was extremely fruitful at seminary and I was valedictorian in college twice and uh, I, I accomplished about 11 years of schooling and seven years with top top marks and uh, I came out and I was like okay well you know the church I was at was like okay well we can't we can't afford uh, to pay anything and we can't you know we can't keep you here because I just gone through seminary but you know, it's it's just something where every door was closed and there were attacks from every side and everything was really relentless and um, I saw myself at my worst and and just being mad at God at times and just saying God why it's like I've done all these things you told me to do these things I've done them but even in doing all of that it's not our entitlement to receive anything God often blesses with amazing things but again we're not entitled and uh, and any lashing out at God or any any doubt of God through those times is sinful, and we need to renounce those things. And you know, God amazingly provided a job. Uh, it, it wasn't in ministry, but it was a bivocational job, so I can continue ministry. And, and you know, I was running pretty much out of money. It's just like, oh, bank account. <laughs> God, please help. And um, it's interesting. Like I've always, I've always. Uh, I guess up until seminary, I always envisioned that I would just do, oh, okay, up until seminary, I always envisioned that I would do computer science as a tent making job and, you know, program and then do ministry, 
you know, as, as the main focus, but, um, but definitely have a tent making job. When I went to seminary, it was kind of glamorized and I think I was kind of reprogrammed to, uh, to feel entitled where, you know, I thought, okay, well, I've done all this schooling, but everything I've been taught is, well, a church should pay a pastor. Uh, a pastor doesn't have to be married. I think that's very clear from a honest read of first Timothy three and Titus one. Uh, if it, if it's applicable, which in most cases, like 90 some percent, that's good things to look for. But a lot of the people who were appointed again, were single. And so that was beat into my head too, that, okay, you're a single man. You're following after God's call, follow after him and, and, and be paid for it because that's, that's the people of God's duty to you. And it's really not a necessity because if God calls you to do something, like for example, if you're, if you, if you were the apostle Paul, you would also do tent making or, you know, working with leather. And that was his skill. God often gives us these talents and skills so that we can use them to fund what we need to do for him. And in this case, computer programming is that for me. It's interesting. I learned to read from the Bible and a computer manual. <laughs> so uh, I always pressed buttons. But just because we go through every little thing and we have you know, the world in our eyes doesn't mean that God is entitled to give us anything. It's great when he does, and it's often the pattern that, hey, we're going to be like that Psalm 1 man. We're going to bear fruit in our season, and like that Psalm 128 man, where uh, we're going to enjoy the the fruit of the labor of our hands. We're going to have a wife that's fruitful, uh, have children round about our table, and see the peace of Jerusalem. All these great blessings, and the psalmist talks about that quite a bit. Uh, regardless of whether it's David or Asaph or anyone else. Solomon wrote one. Um, but uh, yeah, but God is good and God blesses as he desires. And we go through some seasons, which uh, I definitely see that as a forging season, in which I was like, okay, well, you know, looking back on that, I'm not going to go back to that. But God really formed me through that time. And, uh, and seeing myself at my worst, I realized, hey, you know, there's some things that I need to deal with, and, and I'm going to deal with them right now. And uh, I do believe that, A, if, if God brings you through that season, he's preventing something in the future that you don't see. That and, there are seasons in which you have drought, and you can be abased like the Apostle Paul, and then others where you can abound. And so when you go through disastrous seasons, or times of complete drought, or just complete confusion where you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, and everything is just absolutely depressing, and you can't function, you get to that point where it's just like, I can't do anything. Um, and the frustration is just, you know, you're, you're sleeping more than you want. You wake up late, you're out of energy. You don't know what to do. And that's literally uh, a season that a lot of people go through. And so we need to, we need to one, have compassion. Um, so just as in Second Corinthians chapter 1, we, we go through things so that we can be comforters to those going through the same things that we went through. It uh, doesn't mean that all of us will go through the same thing. Uh, like, a, for example, last week I gave the example of a drug 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 abuser being okay. You, it's 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 uh, the main thought. It's not necessary to abuse drugs to be able to counsel someone who's abusing drugs. Uh, in a lot of those cases, too, people have wrecked minds from that. And if you go through that, and you know, God can use that. Great, that's an experience that God can use, but that doesn't bring it above God's word. We all have God's word to look to in all these uh, in all these counseling situations, and that's prime. But whatever God brings you through, you know, sometimes it's 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 a cross. You're seeing the understanding from the Lord's perspective, but you don't have to go through that drug abuse and have any damage in counseling someone who ha has gone through that same experience. But um, anyway, we need to have comfort for people who are really struggling and going through depression and. Uh, need to be there for them and just listen as well as, you know, just, just, just being there. It's, it's, it's so, um, uh, what was it called? Um, incarnational, uh, but being, being there in the flesh, um, just being there with them, present with them is, uh, extremely important. And so in ministry, it's, it's not always, uh, saying this, that, or the other. Sometimes it's just being there. And, and showing them through your actions that, hey, I love you. I'm showing you the love of Christ. I would, you know, I would want someone else, someone else to be there for me if, if I were going through this type of situation. But uh, 
you know, just being selfless and, and being uh, being available and hey, always being ready to to open up scripture and and use that skillfully because it is a sword, but it is a um, a sculpting type of sword where it cuts joints and marrow, it exposes everything, but it's used so well for comfort. Um, okay, so uh, thinking about Job in Job's situation, he had he had everything, uh, a ton of children, which is awesome again, and yeah, still recommend that. You know, have have a lot of kids. As happy as the man whose quiver is full of them. Um, as children are compared with arrows there. <laughs> so you have the, the like, arrows behind in your quiver and yeah, they're children. That's the image in Psalm 127. Um, but Job had, had all these blessings and yet he worships when they're all taken away. And let's have that same reaction. And, and he says, okay, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed is the name of the Lord. And in all that he sinned not and did not charge God foolishly. Those are two things. Let's not sin in our struggle and let's not charge God foolishly. Let's not blame him for, for things that he doesn't deserve blame for. He's given us this life. He's given us breath. And um, I guess just, just be resolved to honor God and to honor his timing because God has, uh, God does have timing. Like in the fullness of time, he revealed his son. Uh, in the fullness of time, he brings blessings into your life. He brings you into the world. He, he gives you uh, enough sustenance for the day and he brings you through certain times but he does that all in time how many times in your life too maybe even just take a minute and think how well okay how has god provided in the past and how timely was that provision because god knows exactly what you need when sometimes we want something even more uh, and even then like uh, we see that if, if god put that puts that desire in our heart let's just ask him for it and oftentimes he'll, he'll grant that and, and we'll be amazed uh, but God grants all those things because um, he is He is good. He's our loving father. He is our Abba, our our, our dad, <laughs> who provides for us so generously. Um, but, but again, we're not entitled to receive every little blessing. And you see, you know, music videos where it's like, well, this is my life before Jesus. And it's like nothing. And then, oh, this is my life after Jesus. And it's like, yay, mansion, car, auto. And there are actually videos and cultures that believe that Jesus is there just for prosperity. Um, sometimes God does bring prosperity. And we see here Job's case, Abraham's case, Isaac's case. It's not a sin to have money. It's not a sin to be rich. But if your heart is in the money and in the riches, then you've crossed that line. Jesus said you can't serve both God and money. But oftentimes God will put you in a place in which you can provide and give generously and more generously than most in situations in which you are provided much. So always keep your ear open to how the Lord guides you on how to spend your money because your money is God's gift to you. Even if you work for it, you work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, which that would be horrible. Uh, but if you're working a 40 hour week or working two jobs or three jobs, the gift that God has given you in living and being able to have talents and use them to work and to gain sustenance is another gift that he has for you. You, you, you do work, but it's not yours. <laughs> you know, God can take away your life at any second. God can take away possessions at any second. And oftentimes if we put things before him, he starts to pull things away one at a time. And when that happens and we react, we can be against him and lash out against him and be angry and turn away from him and have a reaction exactly opposite what Job had. Uh, so we just need to be careful where our, where, uh, who our God is. That's the big thing. Is God really God to you? Or have you put possessions in his place or, or any little thing, any relationship in his place? That's so common to, we can be so eager to want something that's good. God has made relationships good. And, and romance is, is great. It's a blessing. Love is a gift from God. But sometimes things weren't meant to be. Sometimes God wants you to focus on him first. <laughs> he always does. Uh, but if we have a relationship that's you know, trumping God in priority, uh, that's dangerous. And so uh, we need to focus on the true blesser, the one who gives every good and perfect gift. It doesn't say every good and perfect gift comes from hard work and your use of your ta your use of your talents, which are all your own, that's not what James says. James says every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of Lights, 
with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. We need to ask him in faith, but God gives us so many great things. And so um, let's just keep our priorities straight. But in Job's case, he kept his priorities straight even in the midst of disaster when he lost everything. And let's just be faithful and uh, really take some time and just commit that to, to God and say, hey, you've blessed me with so much, but I'm not going to let these good things that you've blessed me with become a stumbling block where I'm worshiping that instead of you. Because we need to worship God. And we're going to see him bless uh, in various ways uh, throughout our life. Um, so, Job is one great example. If you go over to Habakkuk, and I won't go through the whole book of Habakkuk, or Habakkuk, if you like to pronounce that in Hebrew. I think that's actually a, a, a chet also, so that might be Habakkuk, I think that is. Um, but anyway... Habakkuk gets a word from the Lord. Um, yeah, in chapter 1, he cries out to God and says, You know, my people are wicked. Um, it's like, how long, how long will I cry and, and you won't hear? Um, and God has a plan all along. Habakkuk, here's the Lord's plan. The Lord responds, I'm going to do something about this injustice. Uh, it, from from my people, and I'm going to raise up this Ka uh, the Chaldean nation, and uh, he describes it as the bitter and hasty nation, and he's going to overtake his people. So God uses these people as chastisement, and Habakkuk is like, wait, 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 what? It's like, okay, look, you're God, um, and you you know you're using them for judgment and for correction. Um, and then, yeah, shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay their nations? Um, and then he waits for the, he waits for the Lord's rep reply and the Lord makes it very clear, um, you know, live by faith and he's going to deliver his people. He's going to take down that nation, the Chaldean nation that would you, would be used for chastisement. And so we see the Lord has a just plan. But he did want to teach his, his people that you know, he is the Lord, that um, that they would need to give up this injustice, and instead of walking in right conduct before the Lord and, and doing and uh, doing as a, uh, according to his his heart, they were doing exactly opposite. And so uh, he, he says, "Okay, well, you know, I'm going to take care of them." And Habakkuk prays this prayer, and the prayer isn't. God, you're so unjust. I can't believe you're going to take your people and you know, subject them to the rule of a nation like the Chaldeans. I mean, come on. Because I mean, a lot of us would think that too, or you know, like, oh, you know, we're we're Christians, and yet how are all these other people blessed, and and we're we're struggling, or how these people have this much money, we don't, or it's the entitlement, and we we always think, man, I deserve this. And we're taught that too, is well, we work and so we deserve pay. And uh, America is set up that way. Most nations are set up that way. Any man made rule is pretty much set up that way. It's a merit system and performance based. But what God wants to teach us is regardless of what happens, He's going to be with us. And the Lord is our shepherd, not just in the good times when our cup overflows and goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. Uh, we still have that to look forward to. We'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But even though we've been led to green pastures and to still waters, and God is our shepherd, the Lord of the universe is our shepherd who takes care of us. We still have those valley, uh, we still have those valleys of the shadow of death, which we go through, and yet He is there with us, and He comforts us, and He leads us through them all. So if you're going through a dark season, or if you're going through a depression, and you feel like you can't function, you don't have the energy to do uh, what you think you could be doing or should be doing, or if you can't hear the voice of the Lord and you're really in what some people call a night season, uh, I'm going to pray for that even just now. Uh, I want to read you a, a psalm of comfort after it too, but thinking of the, the responses, uh, let me cover this first, talking about Habakkuk, because he prays this beautiful prayer, and uh, it's considered a psalm. It's a, it's a essentially a verse of worship. And 
he mentions that he he trembled when he heard uh, what was going to happen, but his conclusion. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. And take that ultra prosperity, because we go through so many hard times, and it's not always the plan immediately for God to bring blessing. Ultimately, he does, and through Jesus, he gives us that full blessing of eternity with him, and that's awesome to look forward to. And thinking of that John, 20, John 5, 24 passage, where we can pass over from death to life because of Jesus. It's his blessing to us. And so we're guaranteed, if we have faith in Jesus, we're faithful to the end, we are guaranteed that we will stand before God and be redeemed and forgiven and justified by faith in Jesus. Uh, but up until then, we have a lot of hard times where, if you look at Hebrews 11, some did not receive the fullness of their blessing because hey, this world was not worthy of them and they were going to receive an even greater blessing when they see the Lord. And that's true with a lot of us too. And we may have the least prosperous life, but if we are faithful through that time, how much is God going to bless us when we see him? And this isn't a reward-based thing. Like, that's not the full motivation of it. Uh, but, you know, if you're going to receive a reward, receive a reward from the best rewarder. God is the God who made us, who gave us these desires, set our focuses in certain areas, and knows everything about us. Even the hairs of our head are numbered. He knows everything about us, and to have him bless us is the, the greatest thing that could happen to us. And for him to bless us with eternal life through Jesus is an eternal blessing that's like no other. No one else can guarantee that. It's just only through Jesus. So, again, to have this reaction where we're like Job, and when everything is taken from us, we can say, well, Lord, you are God. You give, you take away, and blessed be your name. And regardless of what happens and what I have and what I think I'm entitled to, I'm going to serve God. And to, ha to have that heart of Habakkuk where he says, yeah, even though this disaster is going to happen, I'm still going to praise God, even if everything is absolutely desolate. And to have that heart where we don't need things to worship God. And if we have nothing to still worship God and realize that, hey, God, you are God. And just because you are God, you deserve my praise. You created all things. You do all things well. Just to have that, that heart is so key and crucial. So um, at the same time, too, I know that we all go through very hard seasons at times. And, uh, and to have the understanding that at times you just feel you can't function. Or you can't get up out of bed. You're just like, I don't, I, I, there's nothing to live for. Or when you're thinking about, um, you know, I, I, I failed so miserably. Or, you know, I, I did this thing and I, I can never forget this. Uh, just to receive the healing that God brings and the joy that he brings um, is so liberating. And he can empower you to do things even when you don't believe you can do them. Uh, in a lot of those years when I was really just depressed about, well, you know, I, I just feel absolutely worthless and uh, discouraged and dejected because of all these things that, like, I would come so, so close and then, psh, and then it just became like, I just, I can't do it anymore. Um, but even through those times, God would empower me. Kind of like that when, when Daniel falls on the ground um, and... And the angel of the Lord, like, picks him up. Um, just that type of feel where we're empowered by the Spirit of God and he, he enables us to continue. Um, but sometimes it takes a really low season and, and us being at the end of our rope to realize just how much we have through, through God and uh, how much he enables us and empowers us to do anything. And so it's not by might, not by power, but by his Spirit. And he brings along so many great things. But again, let's just let's honor him. Regardless of what season we're in, we need to respond to disaster and frustration with faithfulness. So let's okay, let's pray. And I wanna I wanna take this to the Lord and um, 
yeah, just talk about this. Uh, I have one psalm of encouragement afterwards for it, and we'll talk about it then. All right, but let's pray. Father, I just pray for everyone who's struggling and in a season of disaster and maybe regret or guilt or frustration. Father, for the depression, I just pray against any demonic attack in Jesus' name. Lord, rebuke the enemy over the lives of those who are depressed or dejected or frustrated or stressed in Jesus' name and let them receive the peace that you have. God, I just pray that you would uh, minister continual healing to those who are in a season in which they just feel like they can't operate. I pray that you bring them out of that season and into a season of great fruit. Thank you, Lord God, and thank you for your work in my life, too, in bringing me out of that type of season and bringing me into more fruitfulness and to greater fruitfulness and greater knowledge of you and just greater joy. I pray that for everyone who's stuck in a, a kind of a rut, and uh, I ask that you heal them in Jesus' name. Help, help them uh, just get out of that season, and, and Father, just, again, minister comfort. Thank you for being our comforter. And sending the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, I just pray that, Holy Spirit, you would minister to those right now uh, who are in a season of depression. In Jesus' name, bring them out. Let the season end, God. Uh, but teach them everything that you desire them to learn in this season. Grow them through this season. Lead them through this valley of the shadow of death. And show yourself as a sustainer, as well as the healer and the deliverer. You are God, and you are great. Help us all know you better, Lord. I pray for those who are in a season of guilt and, uh, and I guess, just continual sin that leads them into this dejection and depression. I pray that you bring conviction to the hearts of those who have strayed from you and that, Lord, you would show them just the mighty power of forgiveness that you have through your son, Jesus Christ, that you've done this, you've completed this, and when Jesus said, it, it is finished, he wasn't saying, there's still stuff yet to come that I have to do. It is done, Lord. It's not by works that we are saved, but through faith in you, because of what Jesus has done, I just pray, Lord God, that people would confess Jesus as Lord and Savior even now, that they would reject the lies of the enemy, saying that they're worthless, or saying that there's no hope, or that there's no light at the end of the tunnel. God, we know that even if we struggle every day of our lives, we have Jesus to look forward to in heaven, if we put our faith in him, and that is so much greater than all the suffering that we can endure here just to have that inheritance that you have, Lord God. I pray that people would have that view and turn their lives over to you even now, God, in Jesus' name, that they'd confess their sin and turn to Jesus. And Father, also, those who are just in a season of, of doubt or confusion, God, you're not the God of confusion. I pray you bring light to that right now in Jesus' name, just as fog splitting right now in Jesus' name. Split that fog, God, where people would see, Lord God, and see with clearly See clearly and hear clearly your voice and your leading in Jesus' name. Just bring that about, God. And man, just uh, just do your work. Thank you so much for all the amazing things that you do and being our healer and our restorer and our redeemer and our savior. And Lord God, I just seek that we all honor you and that at that last day we are blameless, we are faithful regardless of what happens. We worship you, Lord God. Even if everything collapses and there's nothing and everything's desolate, God, we worship you and we turn to you, Lord God. I pray that, Lord. And again, break these seasons. Teach us in these seasons. And God, just uh, minister your healing, your deliverance even now. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, I hope that was a blessing. I want to take you to Psalm 46, though. Psalm 46, I'll just read it. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Selah. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved, he uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he has made in the earth. He makes wars to cease unto the end of the earth, he breaks the bow and cutteth the spear in thunder, 
He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, our refuge Selah. And just this core point that God is so great and he brings such healing and such comfort in times of grief and trouble and frustration. And yet we can be still and we can be there and just know that he is God and trust in him. Trust that he has a plan out of everything, regardless of how desolate things look. It's not a guarantee and we're not entitled that anything is going to get awesome or just the way we want. But you know what? Regardless of whether things are desolate, we need to be still, know that he is God. And just walk in that truth, knowing that it's, it's not ours to demand. It's not ours to demand that all of our exact wants are what happens. We can pursue various things, but if we really think about what we want and why we want it, sometimes, I mean, if we have not committed those to the Lord, those things can lead us often into destruction. You think of the prodigal son who was like, oh, well, I want to just, you know, jet out. I'm going to go. And he ends up craving the, the pods that the pigs were eating. And then finally realizing going home, I've gone astray. I've been wayward. And in those cases, too, you see the image of the father of the prodigal son just greeting him with a hug, bring out the best robes, killing the fatted calf, and just having the greatest celebration for the return. It's not that we're supposed to stray and then return, but in so many of our cases, too, that's what happens, which we can stray from God, but he always delights when we run back to him. Um, but let's not take those detours. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're just shooting ourselves in the foot if we're doing that. So, again, if, if you've been wayward and you've been running from God and you've been in a season in which you feel entitled or you've been pursuing your dreams without consulting God and really considering what God, what, Lord, what would you want me to do? As opposed to, hey, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that, man, I'm rolling. Because sometimes we get into that mode as well, and we're taught that. We're taught to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and to pursue everything that we dream. And you can do anything that you dream about. You know what? God has better plans than that. If we think, hey, what do we dream of? We dream of so much money. Um, you know, as a, as a teenager, you'd be like, oh, man, I'm going to get money and women and power and everything. And it, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. If that's not God, if that's not from God... And, you know, the women is definitely not of God. If it's a woman, then cool. And if God provides you a wife and you're a man, then awesome. But uh, if God provides you money and that's his will, then awesome. If God provides you great authority and influence in the world, then awesome. But commit those things to him and always realize that God is king over all. And if we don't consider that and we don't honor him in all we do, we can be just like, as Proverbs said, a man... Uh, man's path leads to destruction. God's path always um, is what we need to follow. And uh, that's kind of the bottom line of this. <laughs> in reacting and behaving in midst of disaster, it's, it's a regardless situation. Regardless of whether we're abased or whether we abound, we need to honor God. We need to trust in Him. And we need to realize that these problems don't last forever. Romans 8.18 is a great verse, and actually gave this verse to one guy who was going through a lot of trouble. The Lord spoke that verse to me to speak to him. And it really administered comfort to him. And it ministered to me too. That's what God's word tends to do. It ministers to all who hear. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And how true is that? <sighs> that we have, we have such a great inheritance to look to. To be with God. To be restored and essentially be re brought back to a restored relationship with him in, in all ways. We can do that through Jesus here. We're still in this, in this realm in which there's sin, there's our flesh, and we're going to struggle with sin as long as we live. We're all going to die as well. It's, uh, if you think of Enoch and Elijah, who are two, um, two who were you know, brought up to God without dying first, um, uh, those as exceptions, and possibly them being the end times prophets who will die, 
<laughs> because I mean they they also were human and would have been guilty of sin. Um, the death rate's a hundred percent, and regardless of how you die, uh, or even really how you live, we're all going to die and we're all going to face God. It says in Hebrews nine twenty seven, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment. And so, um, just taking this seriously, that regardless of your suffering, there's so much greater to look forward to. And so, I will, I'll close out the webcast by just praying, and uh, if you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, meaning he, He's Master of my life, He's Lord and He's King, He reigns over my life, and believing in what He's done for you. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, well, these are the things that, uh, let me just go there. This is uh, the good news of the gospel. The good news. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And then hey, we see eyewitness accounts. These were, this all of scripture is based in the fact that, hey, this is written in an era in which you can go to all these people and they'll corroborate, hey, this was who he was. It wasn't just like, oh, there's this mystical figure that no one has any record of. This was Jesus, well-known figure, and you can go to all these people at that time and say, okay, well, tell me about him. And they could, and we saw extreme exponential growth in Acts, in which people said, hey, these unlearned men have turned the world upside down. And just seeing, hey, well, people believed in Jesus. They, they saw this is the Messiah, and such fulfillment of scripture through Jesus was done. Um, so, so again, he died for you, he rose again, if he didn't rise again, if he didn't resurrect, we would be people most miserable, and it would be useless, but he died as a sacrifice for our sins, he gave his life for us, and he was not guilty of sin, and the wages of sin is death, so the grave could not hold him. Jesus conquered the grave, he conquered death, and he will return. Are you ready? And this is my invitation to you, just be ready. And be ready how? Uh, just as Romans 10.9 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, or Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And important here, for with, the heart, for with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. But, um, if this is the prayer of your heart, I'm going to pray, uh, but if, the, if this is the prayer of your heart, and you want to commit your life to Jesus, and you can, the beauty of this is it's a, it's a video and you can rewind it. Um, but pray this and, and let this be the prayer of your heart if this is, if you, if this is your desire. So um, again, follow after me. God, I'm a sinner. Forgive me in Jesus' name. I put my faith in Jesus. I want him to be king of my life. I want him to be master or Lord of my life. I commit my life to you. I accept your forgiveness. I accept your gift of eternal life through Jesus. I believe Jesus was your son and is your son. I believe that he died for my sins. I believe that he raised again, and that you resurrected him from the grave. I believe that he conquered death and hell and that only through him I can be saved. So I commit my life to you, Lord. And Jesus, I follow you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lead me into all truth. And God, I just, I look forward to seeing you in eternity. But now, Lord, let me see you as I walk through this life. Strengthen me. God, bring me to a place where I can be fed and fellowship with other believers. And put me in your body exactly where you want. So I pray that, Lord. Lord, you're my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. And so again, if you need to go through that and just consider that in your heart. Uh, if you need to commit your life to Jesus Christ, it's the best decision you will ever make. Uh, even greater than who you marry or where you go to school or where you work or, you know, what certifications you get. 
regardless of what it is, Jesus is the most important. And in him all things consist. He is central. He humbled himself to death on the cross. And through him, he takes on our sin. We take on his righteousness. So just consider that. And, and um, I'll close the webcast with that thought. But yeah. React in disaster righteously. Give all things to him. Realize that we're not entitled to anything. That God is God, regardless of whether our situation is desolate or whether it's bountiful. But just as a final prayer, but God bless everyone who's watched. Bring them into a season of great growth, regardless of whether it's in frustration and lack or whether it's in bounty and joy. Father, I just pray that you bless everyone enormously. God, bring about every dream that you've placed on their heart. Strengthen them and yeah, be with them through the very hardest of times. In Jesus' name, and thank you, God, that you guarantee that, that you will be with us even into the end of the age. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, thanks for stopping by the webcast. And remember, next week it will be Tuesday again, and I do not know anything as to what I will talk about, but uh, I'll be in prayer over that. So God bless you, and yeah, go in peace.